I like dancing with Jen Hobby. <laughs> Welcome to The Frenzy. <laughs> I'm Melissa Carter. And I'm Jen Hobby. The Frenzy is here to change the conversation around age. So that you can celebrate all your years rather than lie about them. We celebrate real stories by real women in the hope that you'll share your story too. I'm Melissa and I am a blood donor. So I'm one donation away from my first gallon so far. Wow, that's awesome. I also gave blood yesterday, so I'm a little lightheaded today. So this should be a fun show. <laughs> this will be a great show. <laughs> I'm Jen Hobby, and I believe that everyone should be a restaurant server at least once in their lifetime, because from there you will always make eye contact with your server and you'll be a good tipper. Very nice. Yeah, I did not do that job. I will say that. Coming on, up on today's episode, you're going to hear extraordinary stories of overcoming circumstance. You'll hear from this dynamic, resilient woman who beat the odds. Yes, our featured guest is Araya McGarry. She is a sought-after motivational speaker, master coach, and best-selling author. Araya is an Emmy Award-winning TV host of Live Your Legacy TV, and she's a cancer and domestic violence survivor. Yeah. Plus, Jen has a pep talk to give you a peek into her toolbox for overcoming big struggles. Plus, we encourage you to tell your unique overcoming obstacle story to someone that you trust. Have you subscribed to the Frenzy podcast yet? Why not? It is totally free. So if you have subscribed, we want to say thank you so much. And could you share the news and tell the friend about the Frenzy? We would really appreciate that because we want more women to hear these real stories connecting real women. So, Melissa, before we get into Araya's story, how does the idea of beating the odds resonate with you? So the funny thing is, this just recently happened with my six-year-old son, Mr. Carter. Okay, so Mr. Carter and my baby mama, Katie Jo, are on vacation as we speak at the beach. And it's the first time that he's been to the beach since before the pandemic. So he's about a year or so ago when he went to the beach the last time. He went into the ocean and the ocean slapped him down. Right. Mm. And he was mad at the ocean. And he's like, I'm never going to the ocean again. And so for this trip, I was like, are you excited? Because the beach is one of my favorite places to be. I'm like, anytime you get to go to the beach, because he wasn't excited about going. I'm like, oh. anytime you get to go to the beach, you should take the opportunity. It's just a wonderful thing. He's like, well, I'll go, but I'm not getting in that ocean. I can tell you that right now. <laughs> so he, he, so I got a FaceTime from him the other night. And it was telling me, well, I went to the ocean and I'm not afraid of it anymore. Oh. And so my and so my practical son, that's it. So it's just like I was afraid of it before. I'm not afraid of it now. I'm going to go play my game. I love you. Good night. See you later. And and there was no explanation. However, when you talk about what does it mean to me beat the odds? So in my mind, what I, I didn't get to experience and nobody gets to experience with each individual is what story he told in his own mind, what perception he changed to be able to not be afraid anymore, mm -hmm. like to be proud of my son for the, for the conversations in his own mind as he's in the sand, approaching the water, what he's going to do with the water and that he evolved to the point of, I'm not afraid of you anymore. And there's a mantra that goes in there. And Jen, of course, later on is going to give us our mirror mantra, but you know, that's what it makes me think of. And that's what I reflected on is that's one of the reasons you can't you know, protect your kid from everything is because they need to be able to self-sustain. They need to self-soothe, right? We hear that about babies, but we do it with ourselves. And so beat the odds for me. I mean, I've talked about my kidney transplant story. I talked about giving blood. I can tell you yesterday there was a mantra. Yeah. I, uh, I gave a power red. So I don't know if you know about power red. If you're not a blood donor, mm -hmm. when you go give blood, you give about a pint and that's it. And it takes about 10 minutes and then you leave. Well, with certain blood types, I think it's only O and one other, and I'm an O, um, that, and so I'm a universal donor, which means that I can not only give my organs to anybody, but I can give my blood to anybody. And so there's a power red where they take the blood out, they take the red blood cells out, and they bring it back into your body. So that way they get, they can take more out. So they don't take my plasma and my platelets and everything like you do at a regular donation, they give me my blood back and it was cool. in this machine. And so I'm there for like 40 minutes to do it. And the machine is, has these little gears and turning. Anyway, long story short, it reminded me of the dialysis machine mm. that the blood was being taken out. It was being processed and it was being put back into my body. And at the time I thought, well, you know, how odd for me to have this experience is the first time I did it. And I thought I reflected back on that. And, and I thought, what would get me through this again if I had to be on dialysis? 
And the mantra in my mind was I survived a pandemic. <laughs> so that was the first time ye yesterday that I thought, you know what? I survived a pandemic. I can do anything, no matter how this makes me feel. Cause I was getting a little lightheaded. They had to like put my seat back and stuff. But I was like, it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't even matter if I pass out on the floor. I sur I'm not going to be afraid. You know, I survived a pandemic. So, so to answer your question about what it means to me to beat the odds is the way you beat the odds is not a hindsight story of, oh, well, I struggled for five years before I had my transplant. You know, people who divorced, oh, well, I was in a terrible marriage for so many years, and then I got divorced. And then that's the end of the story. No, how you beat the odds is that every single day, there's 24 hours in a day, there's seven days in a week. And if you're going, that's a lot of weeks in five years to have to tell myself, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. So beating the odds to me is your relationship with yourself. It has nothing to do with the outside. And so my rela my son's relationship with himself is developing to the point now that he is not afraid of the ocean. And so that's what I think about beating the odds. It's it's an internal thing. 80% mental, 20% physical. Every so time. Good. That's so good. And, you know, I was thinking about your kidney transplant and how you survived that too. Mm -hmm. You know, remembering that not only did you survive a pandemic, but you survived your kidney transplant. You've survived a lot of things on the past. And I think relying on that knowledge that you've experienced hard things and you got through those can boost your confidence, right? Yes, absolutely. And you have to remind yourself of that. You have to celebrate mm -hmm. the victories. Mm -hmm. You know, we, Jen and I were, were once a part of a team where the, somebody on the team had said to us, I wish we'd stop to celebrate our victories more in the success that we had. And I'll never forget that, that, that expression because I have taken that with me throughout my life. It's like, just because you get through something, you know, a lot of people are afraid to look back on it and reflect on it because they don't want to go back to that place. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, just like you said, you were in that place and you got past it and you should stop and celebrate the victory of that. So I do celebrate mm -hmm. the victory of surviving a kidney transplant. I do. And I am, uh, and I will continue to celebrate the victory of getting through a pandemic, because if you're alive right now and listening to this, you should celebrate that because so yeah. many people didn't make it and you sacrifice to be able to survive. And so, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are. And for my six year old, I mean, for many of us, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, it sounds silly that, you know, the ocean waves are going to make you scared. You know, kids are afraid of the dark. They're afraid of the ocean. They're afraid of their own shadows. They're whatever it is. That's also in their mind, they're having to get through a dark place for themselves and they should be celebrated for getting past it. And I think a lot of parents need to pay attention to that, that it doesn't have to be something that is, you know, traumatizing or this big, massive experience. Like again, you know, a, a physical illness, it can be something as simple as I conquered the ocean. Mm -hmm. And so when my son gets back to town, I'm absolutely going to stop and explain to him, you need to celebrate the fact that you did that by yourself. Y'all need and to watch Moana them. together. We love Moana. This we'll have to watch it again. Yes, we'll he it loves again. that movie. We'll have, yes. We'll have new meaning for him. Exactly. But you know what? I love what you said. The ocean is a great symbol for all of us. Whatever mm -hmm. it is that you have to overcome, whether that's fear, whether that's a past experience, something you're going through now, the ocean's just a symbol, right? right. I, I love that your six-year-old's given us this great analogy for any sort of obstacle to overcome is that... You got to coach yourself through it and you can overcome it. I love well, it. And the funny thing is, and I don't know if it'll be picked up on here. Let's see. But there's a picture of my son facing the ocean that Katie took. And I have that as my, if you're, if, yeah, this is on YouTube. So if you, YouTube, yeah. you search for the frenzy, but my son facing the ocean and, and Katie was behind him and, and took that picture. And I, and I thought that's, that was symbolic. Like he's facing it down. Mm -hmm. And it brings tears because not just because of him, but because exactly what you said, that to me symbolizes everything all of us have been through mm -hmm. and to just face it down and to just face your fear. I mean, it's all these cliches we hear all our lives, but it, yeah, I mean, beating the odds means that you face it, you do what you got to do, but you do it in, in inch by inch by inch by inch. And that confidence that Jen talks about is the very thing that you need to get through it. And it will build your confidence. So, so awesome. So, so that's awesome. <laughs> See, the frenzy is where you can hear the real story at this stage of life. And just remember that you're not alone. We celebrate all of our stories together here on the frenzy. 
Um, and Melissa, I know, you know, we talk about our own stories and we get to have mm -hmm. this awesome platform where we get to hang out with each other, which I love yeah. and we get to share our stories, but talk about what's the importance of someone else sharing their ocean story with someone trusted in their life. I think for me, it, it changes in its meaning every time we talk about it because it is so dense. The meaning of that is so dense to know your own story is so important. It's and to be able to express yourself is so important. But for me, it's getting to know yourself. Like I, I do think as women, so many times in our lives, we've had to not had to, we've chosen to dismiss ourselves to take care of somebody else. And in the moment we have to, as mothers, we have to, as wives, sometimes we have to, as community leaders, sometimes we have to, but there is a danger in losing who you are. Mm -hmm. And if you can't answer the question, what is it you want in life? Who are you? Like, who are you? Not wife, not mother. Like, so if I say that I'm a mother of my son, well, yeah, but that's attached to my son. Who am I? Who is Melissa? And sometimes that question is harder to answer. So when we talk about storytelling and we talk about telling your own story, sometimes in telling those stories, like when I talk about my transplant or I talk about the pandemic, or I there are times it, within telling the story that I think to myself, man, I can't, I can't believe I did that. You know, I, and it's almost like, oh my gosh, I'm like my own hero. So I think that that's the important is to learn to be your own hero because your story is just as important as somebody else's, but it's more, most important to you. Your story is more important to you than anybody else's story is to you. It should be. And I don't think it is. And so that's why I think, you know, being able to express yourself and knowing yourself is vital because your life will only improve through it. Absolutely. I love that. So ask yourself today, what about your story? Like, what is it that you've overcome and how could you identify that within yourself? Like Melissa said, getting to know yourself, that discovery or who is it that you could share that story with? Right. But you were about to hear the jaw-dropping story of how our guest, Araya McGarry, beat the odds. Uh, is That's coming up in just a minute. But first, let's thank our sponsor. All righty. Do, 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 do. Music is happening. <laughs> Our featured guest today is Araya McGarry, a sought-after motivational speaker, best-selling author, founder of Live Your Legacy Summits, and she's coined the term for being a cancer and domestic violence sir thriver. So please help us welcome our dynamic, unstoppable new friend, Araya McGarry, to the frenzy. Hey, I'm so excited to be here. Woohoo! Oh, I am so excited to introduce uh, you guys to Araya because I, you know, I was trying to think of a way to describe you, my love, because Araya and I have been friends for a long time. And I think it's you are a uh, a champion for philanthropists. Because what I like about Araya is that she is a businesswoman, but she encourages other women to be businesswomen and to make money. But the the motivation behind it usually is so that you can also give to your community more than you would if you weren't making as much money. Is that a good reflection? Yes. Earn more so you can live more so you can give back more. We can't help nonprofits and causes or neighbors next door if we're broke. So if you're able to make money, we should, and then we can be responsible with it and give back. And I always think women feel comfortable with that, right, Jen? Yeah. Because I think women feel like they they need to have a purpose to their money, right? Or to, in making it, they, it helps them not feel as guilty if they know they're going to give some of it away, I think. Totally. Guilty and, about that. I don't yeah. Know. And we have to, we have to get over this guilt around money. Don't we, Ryan? Yes. Yeah. Only 2% of women are the millionaires. And I just don't know. I mean, I understand it, but can we break that cycle? Yes. It's like, why? Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. So Araya, if somebody is just hearing you for the very first time, can you give us a little bit of your background on how did you become an Emmy award winning TV host and now CEO of your production company? Give us a little bit of your background. Where did you get started? Well, I was born at a young age. And, uh, <laughs> well, to make a very long story short, it did happen from a, a, an obstacle. So I really do love giving women hope that um, you can overcome things and that could become your mission, like your tragedies turn to testimonies and all that. But in 99, on my 38th birthday, and I know you guys love talking about age. So mm -hmm. we're going to talk about age right now. And I think your legacy doesn't even begin to your 40s. So ladies, you know, just you know, you're going to arrive at 40 and then just keep getting better and better. So get ready for that. 
And at 38, I got diagnosed with cancer. And during that surgery, they took out half of both my lungs and my thymus gland, the lining around my heart, disconnected half my diaphragm. And then they removed the left nerve to my vocal cord and guaranteed me I'd never speak above a faint whisper ever again. It would be impossible. Well, wow. impossible. Okay. Let's see, either I'm not gonna speak again and I'm gonna live my life. And at the time I was driving winning pink Cadillacs, I was in direct sales and I was 99. We didn't have emails and social media. I mean, I had to get on the phone and people would hang up on me. They thought I was an obscene phone call. I went into mm. chemo, it almost killed me. And that's a true story. I was very, very sick on chemo, throwing up 18 times a day. And then when all that was over, I knew I still didn't have a voice. I could barely speak, but I knew God had a purpose for me. So I wrote a book. I won't survive. I'll thrive. While I was doing that book, I got, I went on a book tour. I was doing news shows. I love TV. I don't know if, if Melissa Toad used to do soap operas. Come from New York City. I wanted to be a rich and famous actress. And I wanted to, that was my world. I love that. And when I went on the book tour, I did all the news shows. It was so much fun. I loved being on TV again, but I realized it was such bad news. And I would be coming on with my Pollyanna good, you know, good story book that you can do it right after they just told a story of a husband shooting his wife and three kids three days before Christmas. And I'm like, there's got to be more people doing good in this world, world than bad, but I'm sure that's just not newsworthy. So I said, I want to start a show that talks about good news. And I thought to myself that who better than the nonprofits, the ones giving their life, giving back, whether it's saving children or women or vets, there's good stories to be told. My husband used to be a, a stunt man. So I said, do you know how to put on a show? Because I've always been the actress, not the producer. He goes, no. He goes, do you? I'm like, no. Great, let's do it. <laughs> Perfect <laughs> business plan. And so we did. We just started telling good stories. And I just tell women, start. If you have a dream, start because we met the right people as we went forward. I would never want you to see that first interview I did in a little school house here and coming that let me do it for free, two heads talking. It was probably, I had a high school person doing the filming, you know, and but it led to, you know, the 21st episode in one year that was the Ron Clark Academy, the 22nd episode that won me the Emmy. Because when you're doing what you love, I just really am an encourager, just start. And if it's not meant for you, the doors will shut. Okay, so you tried it and work. That's right, you get a lot of that. But you don't know if you can be the next award-winning whatever you wanna be, unless you give it a whirl. And if you have it in you that you wanna do it and it excites you, then that's kind of a sign. It's something you could do and do it. Cause you know, I met all the right people along the way that took me to the next level. Did I run out of money? Absolutely. Did I get another opportunity to do something else and then find the money? Absolutely. So miracles happen, but they can't if you sit around thinking, I'm too old, I'm too this, I'm too that, I'm too late. It's too crowded out there. Just stop, just go. And you will surprise the heck out of yourself. So at 48, I won my little girl dream of being able to say, I'd like to thank the Academy. <laughs> yes. Look at that. Who can't? You know, now I'm going to be 60 this year. And it just got better and better. So go team and go over 40. It's awesome. The water's great. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> Even if you don't have no clothes on. So <laughs> well, that's a Melissa story. <laughs> that's a Melissa story usually. All right. So Araya, <laughs> um, we talk about representation matters. And I think that in this case, what's not being talked about is representation of women over 40 who are su succeeding at something they started after 40 uh, and continuing to have a greater and greater life as they age. And so uh, you're a testament to that because mm -hmm. before 40, like you mentioned, and there's even other stories where you had obstacles in your way. You talk about the pink Cadillacs and being a salesperson. Well, I, you know, Ray and I met at a domestic violence rally uh, because Araya had had experienced domestic violence. And so you had all this happen before 40. My dad was murdered by the mafia when I was 15. And her dad was murdered by the mafia before she's, I mean, in New York. So mm -hmm. here we, we're talking about things. You have every reason in the world to have given up. You have every excuse in the book where nobody would judge you for giving up, yet mm -hmm. you did not. So maybe talk to women who are over 40 who probably feel like I've given up. I'm too old. I'm too tired. I'm all this. What do you say to these women to get them started like you mentioned? Yeah. Well, absolutely. Well, you have to have a, a, a why, a reason. And I've never had the luxury of not going on. I mean, I'm not, you know, uh, there's no silver spoon in my mouth. You know, when my dad was murdered, 
my silver spoon left because he was the provider. So since 15, if I don't bounce back, what happens to me? You know, we, I just, and I know we've got that in us as women, we are caregivers. There's always somebody we want to help and support. So whatever your why is, is it for you? Is it for your retirement? Is it for your kids? Is it for college? Whatever it is, you've got to find that big why that's so much bigger than if everything goes wrong today. That's so much bigger than if uh, somebody says no to you today, because it's got to take you through that. And I've always had big whys. You know, my daughter's to have done a private school. And then when everybody would say no to me, they didn't want a facial, they didn't want this. It's like, it's just some will, some won't. So what next? And it's over under a round or through, but you won't have that tenacity unless you know why you were doing it. And usually for women, there's somebody else in our life that really needs us and that we're going to do it. But if not, well, you know, what's going to happen to you if you don't? And if this doesn't work, try something else because we just don't have the luxury to sit back and not, mm -hmm. you know, who puts food on the table or how, how do we feel fulfilled? Even if you're being, let's say, taken care of and you've got wealth around you and you don't need the money, then somebody else does. Find a cause, find a nonprofit that since you are established financially, people can use your talents and gifts because they don't have access to that. So you can totally have such a wonderful footprint in the world, but that has to be your why. You can't live somebody else's why or passion. So whatever it is, that'll get you started and get you through. So tell us about your health struggle and going through this cancer. There had to be days where you were just wiped out. Oh, oh, that's the war. I mean, how do you come through a struggle like that? What's one of the biggest lessons you learned from that time? Oh, family and love and friends and support. You know, the, I would say the surgery, as horrible as it sounds, was easy. When I woke up from surgery, you know, I had the, the scary diagnosis, but I got over it pretty quick and I couldn't speak, but, you know, I didn't feel bad. It's like, okay, that wasn't bad. A couple of weeks later, they put me into chemo. I'd rather do anything else in this world than have chemo. And I know, Jen, you're, you're a cancer supporter too, an advocate, and I hate to see children going through this because I threw up 18 times a day for 10 days straight. I would lose 10 pounds overnight, not the diet I wanted, mm -hmm. and I'd be so sick, I'd be passing out. And just as I was feeling better like a human and after you feel metal inside you, it's horrible, then it'd be time for the next dose. And they literally thought I was gonna die from the chemo even though the cancer was curable, but they didn't want to half the dose or play with it because they said, you're so curable, you can just make it through this. So a lot of prayer, a lot of family, people taking care of my family because I couldn't even smell food. If I heard the blender, I would throw up mm -hmm. and it's nothing you can do to help this. And there's most of the days I was wrapped around the toilet bowl in the bathroom, not knowing which end it was going to come out of. And my golden retriever sitting by my side, not moving for six months. And my husband, Brian, taking care of my daughter, Angel, at the time, who was just in eighth grade, I believe, and just everybody doing for you. So that support system is vital. It, it You know that you're not needed. The more, all you need to worry about is getting well. And it really, really helped. And all the prayers. I felt every prayer for sure. So I just got it one day at a time. When you have cancer, it's a moment at a time. I need to get through this moment. And it's okay. But when other people love you and are praying for you, you feel it. I really felt the love during that time. I felt the prayers. And I knew people were there for me. And they'd call. They'd come by. And, you know, they'd bring the food to the the door, my husband would bring it back outside. She can't smell anything. Like, oh, <laughs> right. <there's so> <laughs> right. But at least I knew they were being fed. So but, if you know being able to, it, to re sure. receive help is hard. It is. Because yeah. yeah, for that's sick, you really like, you know, you yeah. give up. It's like, do whatever you're going to do. You're just not micromanaging at that moment. And I'm a micromanager sometimes, most of the time. And it's like, whatever needs to happen. All I could deal with was the bathroom was my home for six months. And I had to be hospitalized for five days after every chemo. That's how sick I was. So I was in the hospital. They finally figured out they hooked me up to IV liquids, just potassium. I wouldn't throw up so violently for so long. And when I'd get home, I'd only throw up for three days instead of 10. Wow. So it was a song and dance that, oh. Do you but, feel like you now really respect your health more than before. Like I know Melissa after her kidney transplant really mm -hmm. was like, wow, my body is this temple and I need to take really good care of it. And I know you also feel so blessed to have life. Do you feel mm -hmm. like that after going through something so hard? I definitely feel that that life appreciation. So every day I'm so glad to be alive. I really started living my legacy, living on purpose. All that started after cancer, for sure. And I'm probably in very normal where, where after the chemo, I spent a thousand dollars a month on vitamins and nutrients and and coffee enemas and colon cleansing, 
all of that, going, making sure you rebuild. That lasted maybe a year or two. And then you start getting back to kind of, you know, I eat healthy. I don't, you know, smoke or drink or then we'll drink socially. But I mean, there's nothing I do that's like out of the norm, that's unhealthy. I'm not a fast food eater in that, but I like my chocolate, Miss Lissa knows. <laughs> you know, and I'm not I'm a big- sister. I know, I got it. You know, I'm not out there jogging and exercising like I, like I would, because you know, I don't get breath. It's hard for me to breathe. So exercise isn't as adorable as it used to be. So I'm not an avid health guru, but I definitely appreciate life and I do the right things and eat the right things and take vitamins and stuff, but I'm not over the top but I'm taking good care of myself as I can, but appreciating life. I live every day like it's my last. I make memories every day. When my daughters want to go to lunch, it's like, I want to stop and do that because I know they're not going to remember the money I made. They will remember the lunches we had. But can we get over this COVID quarantine? Because me and Melissa are so <laughs> locked up. We just look, want to do lunch. Look, I, I think Araya. I want to I want to yeah. come. I yeah. guess, Dan, yes. Araya is is yeah. fit to be tied to get out that door. I mean, like. His- <laughs> Outside. I've got my whole, you know, yeah. look how wildlife I'm playing with. Look, there's a balance to life. So, Jen, I, we're going to explain this. There's a balance to life to all women. And here is an example of how you should be proud of whatever it is you're into. So, Array, would you like to share? I mean, she's this, you know, fierce businesswoman. We'll talk about the Live Your Legacy Summit that she started that I really has inspired so many women. But let's talk a little bit about your your what do you call what do you call the cam? My critter cam. Critter cam. Go My ahead. Cam. Okay. Right. Well, it happened pretty early on with quarantine. I'm sitting here in my office here, and right to my right is my beautiful porch in my yard. And and I noticed there was for the first time I've lived here like 20 years, and I love animals. And I used to have a little chipmunk in like Plaza used to come up to me and I used to feed him. I've got a picture. I have not seen a chipmunk since I've lived here 20 years. And all of a sudden I'm seeing chipmunks because now all of a sudden you're noticing things around you because you're not running in and out like we normally do in our real mm-hmm, world life. True. So kind of stop and smell the roses. So my roses are four-legged and with fur and they would come and crawl up my window. So I put out a chipmunk feeder. Then all of a sudden I was getting the squirrels Then I was getting birds and put out a bird feeder. Now I've got four chipmunks and like all these beautiful exotic birds I've never seen before, besides the cardinals and everything. Then I started um, thinking, I wonder what else is out here. So we had a, a ring doorbell and I noticed one night there was a possum. I'm like, I got a possum, maybe there's raccoons. Put out another critter cam, put out a little food. Now I've got a smorgasbord of fruits and cat food and all sorts of things out there. I have four possums. I watch them on my critter cam. They bring me such joy. Sometimes I just will listen to them crunch. It's like somebody eating Captain Crunch, 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 crunch. And they're so cute. And I just love them. Can you hear the joy? Can you see the joy? So adorable. (laughs) So whatever turns you on, you know, do it. And, and you will we'll give your social stuff out later, but I think you should stream. I think there I think there should be a YouTube oh, yes. stream of the critter can. I really think there's another money maker for you. There you go, blossom the possum. I do know a woman who took in a baby possum that had been abandoned by its mother, mm-hmm. and it is now her pet. Yeah, like it sits you know they're very on her clean. Shoulder and watches yep. TV and stuff. I'm I used like, to have a kangaroo. My kangaroo used to sit on my shoulder and watch TV. What? I had a Domus kangaroo. That was my first anniversary present Brian gave me. And it was a little Domus kangaroo. That's <laughs> wild. Oh my gosh. That's See, a TV show. Isn't <laughs> it? <laughs> she, yes. she, you, you, that's your next Emmy is host of an animal program. Well, that's what I won my Emmy. Yeah. yeah, I won my Emmy for doing the Noah's oh, Ark right. show. That's and I right. had a thousand pound bear and cougars and pythons. It was, a, about that. it was a perfect day. 11 hours. <laughs> animal to animal to animal. You know, for 11 hours, I didn't take a potty break. I didn't drink a sip of water. We were going from animal to animal to animal. I mean, I could have gone on for another three weeks without even thinking of, you know, doing what you love. I just encourage women, do what you love. That's You'll exactly never feel like you're working. Whatever well, it is. That's what that's exactly right. And that's why I say, I mean, I tease Araya about her critter cam and, yeah. and her, her being Snow White with all these animals. Snow okay. White's the one, right? And Cinderella yeah. had animals too. But anyway, she's a Disney character, right? Oh, a Disney character. Uh, but I do want to go back to the Live Your Legacy Summit because, oh, like I said, Araya and I met at a domestic violence rally. But then I had the privilege to speak at her Live Your Legacy Summit, and that was empowering other women. So explain why you started that and, and what it's about. And I'm assuming after the pandemic, we're going to have those back. Oh, yes, yes we are. Okay. Yeah, I miss it. Oh, I miss events. Um, I had met Tori Johnson. You know, she does um, Deals and Steals and Good Morning America now. And I'd met her. And I just was coming out of winning the Emmy for my TV show, which was back in like 2010 when we were 
the economy was crashing and all that horrible stuff going on. And I remember Wes Sargentson, who was one of the NBC news news anchors that had won like nine Emmys. And he goes, he helped me direct this particular episode. And he goes, you know, Ray, any other year than this year, if you'd won the Emmy, sponsors would be lining up for you. I'm like, oh, great. So mm -hmm. any other year but this year, I should have been successful. Again, over, under, around, or through. So long story short, I met another phenomenal woman on the phone through a friend, it was Tori Johnson, and she was doing all these women's events, Spark and Hustle, all this great stuff. And she goes, she saw my dilemma, no money, had a passion, but no, there was no way to monetize it at that moment in that economy. So she goes, why aren't you doing women's events? With She knew all about me and all the success and all I was trying to do. And she said, you can take that love for the nonprofits and put together a, a live event. And sponsors love being at events. They love sponsoring events more than TV, where they're more distant from people. They don't know who's watching, whole nine yards. And I said, oh, well, I don't know how. I've seen a lot of bad events in my day and and the host like pulling out their hair. She goes, no, they don't do it right. He, she goes, I will show you how to do it. So I hired her to show me how to do it. And the Live Your Legacy Summit was born teaching women how to be successful no matter what. I bring in speakers that talk about being successful despite obstacles. And then we honor nonprofits and people giving back to the community. And there's no selling. It was one of those events where it wasn't about selling. It's about women coming to this event and leaving knowing that that woman can do it. We had Kim Coles on the stage. We had Melissa Carter on stage. We need to meet <laughs> Melissa Carter. She's amazing. I was um, say, th those two names, I don't know if they go in the same sentence together, but that's cool. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> We've had Jeff Foxworthy and his daughter. We've had um, Brenda Cooper who did the, the wardrobe for the nanny and won a primetime Emmy for that. Just, But I did want to show them for them being like, wow, like look at them. It's no real women doing real things and you can too. Very relatable. And then during the mastermind times is when the coaches could could sell a small ticket item if they wanted to draw if somebody wanted to buy from them but very inspirational not selling and helping charities and just helping women walk out of there saying i can do this because i don't know a woman that doesn't have an obstacle and if she doesn't have one today she'll have one tomorrow mm -hmm. and we just got to make it through so i can encourage and, and get everybody you know excited enthusiastic all day long but if you don't have the tools to make it through the bad times and the techniques and strategies and the will to make it through when the, everything hits the fan tomorrow that you know you can plow through it no matter what and that's what it's about and we'd be do, we would have done our 13th our lucky 13th 2020 but well we it, had other i don't think i don't think it's a coincidence that 13th the 13th year fell on 2020 that's kind of weird. I know. Maybe it is unlucky. Maybe I skipped 13, but I can't do it this year because I don't want to do it virtual because my summit is all about people and hugs and being in that corner, being able to have that private conversation with somebody. And I heard that's what we're really missing. We have all these virtual events going on right now, which is great, but we don't have that private time at the table. We can say, oh, have you heard? You know, not that it's gossip, but it's filling in your friend sitting next to you or the, when you meet in the bathroom and you talk about something, we're all always together and there is no private conversation unless you're chatting then you make a separate phone call fine but i want to have my summit my 13th one in person so it'll probably be 2022 before melissa and i can do it safely because she's going to be there and so are you jen so awesome i'm in tell me what does live your legacy mean it means you live a life that when you're gone people remember you how you wanted to, them to remember and women we get caught up living everybody else's legacy what is our children doing yes. they're dreams coming through it too our husbands our spouse our significant other your partner it's all about somebody else and i want women to not all the kids grow up and and fly the coop and you have your home empty nester like oh What's my purpose now? And you might pass away. You might not have 20 more years. We don't know. We saw what COVID did and we've lost 400,000 people. Uh, it's you know? half a million at this point. Oh yeah. God, half a million people. So I want women just be living on purpose, living their legacy today. So when that day comes, which it will come, we just don't know when, we know that we left the footprint that we wanted to. We designed it. We we helped the charity and a cause we wanted to help. We didn't wait till well when the kids move out, I'll give back. You know, that'll be my retirement years, or when I'm done with this, or when I get a divorce, or when I meet my my significant other. Stop all the waiting. It's what can you do today just to make somebody else's life better? Can you feed a possum that's hungry? <laughs> can, you, <laughs> can you feed a child? We work that possum, man. Possum. Well, Araya, what I think is neat too is that everyone wants a different legacy. You know, we mm -hmm. don't all want the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so can you speak to that woman that's like, you know, I've always thought that I would be great at, you know, taking photographs of, yes. you know, of, 
the older people, or I, I've always thought that I could, you know, tend to animals at the zoo, but I've never done it. Talk to that woman who's never really pursued what her dream is. How do you give that dream validity? Oh my gosh, that's exactly what they need to do. Whatever is beating in your heart that that small, still voice is saying, oh, I, here's what I tell my, my clients and my friends. I say, I say this, when you were a little girl or a little boy, and your parents' friends up to you and pinch you on the cheek and you hated it. And they say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you, without hesitation, said, I want to be an astronaut. I want to be an actress. I want to be a movie director. I want to be a photographer. I want to be a prima ballerina. It's that dream I want everybody to go back to. Before everybody told you, you can't, you're too fat, you're too this, you're not smart enough, it's too crowded, oh, you'll never make that. And I want you to go back to it because in that dream is something you can do. Let's say you're 40 and you can never be a prima ballerina, but you can open up your own dance studio. You don't have to be the dancer. You could, you could inspire the next generation of ballerinas. You can get a camera if you want to be a photographer and start taking pictures. You want wildlife? Come to my house. Take pictures of my wildlife. We can start you as a wildlife photographer. But whatever you want to do, you could start now more than ever and start uploading it to YouTube, uploading it to social media. Instagram's a great place to show off your photography work. Right now with social media, you can almost take whatever your dream is and let other people see it or know about it. But you got to know what it is. And there is no wrong answer. And I didn't want you to stop thinking that. I want the people that are listening or watching, stop thinking, oh, God, I used to want to be. Okay, mm -hmm. well, let's examine that. How could you be involved in that in a different way? You know, like, look, look what happened to Tiger Woods today, at, yesterday with the accident. And they're wondering, thank God he's alive, but they're wondering, will he ever play golf again? My thought is, even if he never plays golf again, I mean, he's done his, yeah. his, his life, his legacy, he's got his children now. He can always teach. He's got his life in his brain. He can coach, he can teach, he can speak. There's a million other things he can do in his dream life of golfing. So think of that as you. Are you, you thinking you're too old or too this or too that or it's too late? Think, okay, let me put my foot in it. Well, how about go volunteer to a nonprofit when they let us out of this cage, but go volunteer <laughs> in the industry that you love. If it's right. kids, if it's wildlife, if it's photography, if it's whatever, there's a nonprofit that supports it probably that you can just start getting in the mix. Mm -hmm. There's always a way to open the door just to dabble your foot, dip, dip your toe in it. Mm -hmm. And it might not be what you thought it was going to be when you were five, but you never know what, I mean, who would think I'd win an Emmy, not for being an actress, but for creating my own TV show that spotlights nonprofits when I shouldn't have a vocal cord and I shouldn't be talking. That was not my dream. I used to say when I was five years old, yes, I want to have cancer, get my vocal cord ripped out and then, you know, be a TV show host and win my, no, I was like, I just want to be an actress. So think about that crazy little kid dream you had and see what you can do with it because there's magic in there. Because I believe God put that in there as your special sauce and, and nobody can do it the way you can. So don't even look at competition because nobody is you. Well, and that's the difference, Araya, of a 60-year-old Melissa. I mean, I'm 51 now, but, you know, I, I, was, I was trying to round the number up. Six-year-old <laughs> Melissa and six-year-old Melissa, uh, where at six years old, I, ha I haven't gone through the struggles. And so I think what people, men and women, but since we're talking to our, our women, what you have done is taken those obstacles and made them your legacy. Mm -hmm. Right. If yeah. you if you don't pursue what it was or whatever your passion is, what you've done is the exact and you've done exactly what you didn't want to do, which is the cancer is your legacy. The divorce is your legacy. I mean, we all know women who have gone through something and, and seem to be frozen in time at that moment of despair and never have moved forward, even though 20 years may have gone by. They're still talking about whatever happened back in 19, whatever right. it is. And so your so your legacy is very important. And so to your point, Array, I think about right now. If if you're not doing anything, your legacy is something negative. Yeah, as you got to, you're moving forward or backward. There's no standing still. So, and if you've been through something, why not help somebody else? Why? Because nobody else can talk to a like Melissa. Nobody else can talk to a kidney transplant survivor, but you. I can't talk to them. I don't know what that was like, but you can. You know, we all have our our stuff, and our stuff can be what we help other people go through that same stuff with. Mm -hmm. You know, the people I can talk to that Jen can't talk to. I things people Jen can talk to that I can't, and vice versa. So, what have you been through? You're not alone. There is no first time in anything you could possibly go through in this world. It is not the first time guaranteed. There's somebody else out there that's been through and done that. So why don't you become one of them that say, okay, I'm going to help somebody else. And once you're willing, you'd be surprised how they will find you. You know, they, they will. Mm -hmm. You could be a mentor to somebody. 
Or you could, you know, like I said, go out and reach out to a nonprofit that supports the cause that is causing you pain. And you can be part of the relief of pain just because you've been there and done that. Even if you're not through it yet, I always say reach out. There was one thing that really helped me through my domestic violence escape. I didn't do it alone. You know, my mom helped me and then other people helped me. Trying to do something like that alone is is near impossible. You've got to have that that one friend that's up that can pull you up. And then you become that friend that pulls somebody else up. And you don't have to force that to happen. It'll happen. As long as you allow somebody to help you, then when the time's right, you'll be the helper to somebody else. Araya, we're all about celebrating older women and celebrating age. So what do you think that older women do better than anyone else? Mm. Everything. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> older wise. Well, when I become an older woman, I'll let you know. I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> What is old? Oh my gosh. I think we have really good bounce back ability. I found that once I hit 50, now that I'm about to be 16, just a few months, my, I don't know if I can, I, Melissa. Now look, no, I, Ray, if you say, I don't know if I can say something, then you absolutely I, need to say it. I, it's yeah. like my give a damn is broken, but I could say something go. else. That a girl. <laughs> my, my patience Array, is like, Array is so pure. She's so pure. She doesn't want to cuss. She doesn't want to talk about sex. She doesn't want to do anything <laughs> like that that's going to make her see. <laughs> Yeah, she's an angel. See the, that hello. So yes, you can say give a damn. That's that is that is something that is outside her comfort zone. So I'm proud of you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It's just you get on a mission, and then when you don't really care so much what other people are thinking, you don't let the stupid stuff stop you. It's you realize your life now is you're on the other side of that life. You're halfway done. You know, however long we have, and I want to be like Betty White at 99, kissing a grizzly bear. You know, and have still she was still doing sitcoms. She was still, a, you know, hosting Saturday Night Live at an old age. So think about the Dolly Partons, the the Betty Whites, the Jane Fondas that are still doing what they do. All look completely different, but doing what they love to do way after 50. So I think you just start getting better mentors. You get stronger, wiser, and you really don't. Like I said, give a damn about what the younger ones are doing because now you're so much smarter. You've got so much more wisdom and the smart people will tap into that and you just have to kind of recreate yourself. But I think the strength and the power comes after 40 and definitely after 50. And I'll call you back after 60. But I have a going to get even more. <laughs> I think we snowball into this great wealth that I think the, the other parts of this world, I think value age a whole lot more than America that we just kind of throw away the aging. But I know in other countries, I just think of, you know, just even in, you know, Asia and the Orient that when you're older and what you're older, you're wiser. And they seek out the counsel of the older, the grandmothers, the grandfathers in America, we're like, put them in a nursing home. Oh, COVID well, got them. oh, well, you know, 80% of the COVID half a million people that died in this country, 80% of them were older people. I know, it's and so we throw that we throw older people away in our society. And that's what Jen and I are here to change. Absolutely. Absolutely. If I could give anybody advice that's listening to this that may not think they're old, they might be 35 or 20. Talk to somebody that's over 40 and over 50. And I dare you to talk to somebody over 70 and 80 and the stories they have to tell and what they've been through to make it to 70, 80 and 90. There are some skills there especially if you've got your mental capacity and you're able to have conversations and you're, you're still vibrant in this world. I want to talk to them. They've seen some stuff. They've mm -hmm. been through stuff. They cannot tell me they haven't been over, under, around or through. Why wouldn't you want to tap into their secret sauces and how they got through it? They've been through depressions. They've been through good economy and bad economy, good presidents, bad presidents, just everything you could imagine. And they're still here. So right. tap into the wisdom because nothing, you can go to school all day long, but nothing, nothing compares to the wisdom of age and living life and having what we call street smarts. And the longer you're, you're out there on the streets, the smarter you're going to get. Yeah, absolutely. It's something we've started doing with my girls on the way to school. My husband takes them some days and I'll, I'll take them other days. And on the way to school, they always want to call a grandparent and ask them for a story. Oh, and, that's wonderful. So sweet. That. I've learned so many stories from my mother-in-law, <sighs> from my mom and dad. And it's been a really cool little tradition that we've stumbled upon. So I just wanted to share that. And you know, to take back on what oh, Araya was saying about what a great it. idea. To like see, that's a podcast. Out those stories because as soon as you ask mm -hmm. they're willing to share but we don't ask mm -mm. we don't ask and they want us to ask you know it, it, mm -hmm. and one quick story as you both spoke that that um changed my view of prejudice 
Okay. Uh, force prejudice, like society kind of giving you those cues. So when I grew up in the 80s, it was anti-Russia. Russia was awful. It was Red Dawn, all this stuff, nuclear war and all that stuff. So when the, I was going through that as a teenager and, and my activist self was being, you know, kind of it, it, it ignited, you know, my mother explained when she was young, it was the Japanese because we yeah. were approaching, you know, <laughs> World War II. And she was like, it, it, I I had a prejudice against the Japanese because I was expected to. And she's like, you have a prejudice against Russia because you're expected to. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, I wonder what the next group of people will be that we're expected to hate. And I, it just that one thing made me realize, wow. wait a second, she's right, that it changes. And so the so it, it, it kind of takes away the depth of it because it's like, oh, this is something that's just a phase. And we have to remember that and not take it so seriously. Right. So, you know, to your point, those stories are so important because it gives you a contrast of what you're doing and what's real and what's not real. Hey, you know, Melissa, we, we've been talking about this a lot this this year on our Smart Talk about now, unfortunately, I think that if you look back at 2020, who is our, our enemy? We Each other. I mean, I've never seen so much hate among one country. Mm -hmm. I mean, the right, the wrong, the, the, the hate, the, it's just been terrible. It's like, who are we against? each other. We don't even need another country to come against us now. Everybody has been attacking each other. We've got a lot of work to do in this country and all the different things that I know Melissa and I are trying to do with Mark as far as bringing our ecosystems together and mm -hmm. listening to each other and helping each other because we don't need the Japanese, the Russians, the, every, anybody else to come in and attack us. We're attacking each other. Yeah, um, based, based on a piece of cloth on our face. That, that, that The enemy lines have been drawn whether you wear a mask or not. And how I ridiculous know. have we, we it's, it's like a Dr. Seuss, the, the one star bellied and the two star two star bellies right in, in the you know they had the there she goes talking about books again i don't know you lost i know it. right i got i got i got a, a, a highbrow on you there uh ray i'm sorry about that um so but yeah ray is talking about smart talk is a show that you can find yeah, on youtube that we do. um so Araya, you know more about the show Araya created it and Araya explained why you brought the people on it that you brought on well, I met this wonderful woman, Melissa Carter. If you don't know her, <laughs> I actually had a, a, a show for on YouTube called Success Talk. And then when all this was happening with George Floyd and all this, um, this upheaval, and you know I me, mean? I don't like hate. I don't like arguing. I, I want to spread peace and joy and love. And I said, there. I know um, I have a friend, Mark Hayes, who is a two-time Emmy nominee from Fox 5 News. He's amazing. He's very strong in Black Lives Matters. I know Melissa Carter and what she's doing in her community and working for Pride and working for um, the Atlanta. What a magazine you, you write for, Melissa? The Georgia Voice. Yeah, Georgia, Georgia Voice. Voice. It was just geared toward the LGBT community. Love it. I love it. And here I am. I do Christian television. I'm a host for WATC Atlanta Live. And But I walk in the Gay Pride Parade. So I'm this eclectic person. And I realized I want to bring the three of us together because we love each other. We've loved each other for a very long time. And we wanted to talk to our whole communities about why can't we all be different? Why can't we have good conversation, laugh, cry, be mad together and still come together from three completely different walks of life that you would think would be at each other's throat and judging and hating. And so I started Smart Talk, brought us together and we've been talking smart for months on end. But I have to tell you, it's really it. gotten me through um, this COVID because they brighten my day like you have no idea. Yeah, we started oh, that. We started. So awesome. We started that as something to do during the pandemic, right? And we're mm -hmm. still doing it. So again, I, that's what I love about Array is that she is trying to uh, inject positivity to people. But you heard her talk about as women, as aging women, there the the positivity you have to inject is in yourself because you're the one saying these things to to you, and mm -hmm. you got to stop with that inner chatter of how bad you are, how a has been you are, your best days are behind you, which is not the case. Mm -mm, not at all. And bringing like-minded friends together again, don't try to do this with life alone. Find a, you know, I always wanted to be a part. I still may be, because I remember them from America Gay days. There was the Red Hat Society, the Red yes. Hat Society. Yes, we've He's talked about them. that. Yep. Yes. Yeah, because their whole thing is about having fun. There's not about business, it's get together and have fun. And mm -hmm. uh, I just always knew that when we're getting out of this, I'm gonna start calling some Red Hat ladies, because they know how to party and have fun. So my, my mother was part of the Red Hat Society really? and she was so proud of her ugly hat but that's the point of the red hat society is that it's it you yeah. you're going to go out with this loud hat and let people know that i'm old and i don't you know and i'm proud of who i and am the older you are the more revered you are so you really become like the queen status the older you are you know if you're 40 you're considered just a baby you know that's right the older you are the, the, the better it is i just love that mindset 
And uh, yeah, so I just think we need just more good conversation, good people coming together and stop with all the same. We were talking about this on the show. If Melissa happened to say this, if you're every book club and every club you belong to, you all look alike, all from the same community, all think alike, what's the point? Reach over the, with the bridges and and be friends with everybody. <laughs> We're talking about I want to be I want to be friends with as many people as I possibly can before I die. And Melissa said, "You just want a big funeral." I'm like, "Yeah, I do." <laughs> <laughs> I do. That's the goal. The goal is to for people to have to go outside the church, right? That's the goal. Mm -hmm. If you live if you live the right life, then the church won't fit all the people that want to come. Yeah, so, you touch so many different people and be of yeah. service. Be about just when you die, you want people to say, "Wow, I'm glad she lived." You know, I'm glad that or he lived because it is even if it's something little, we don't all have to change the world. We're not all going to be Tyler Perry's and Oprah's and and Maya Angelou's and, and, and people that the whole world will know of. But we can be somebody our community knows about. We can be somebody our neighbors know about. Yeah, it's those small random acts of kindness that we talk about that can make a difference to one person. It's like the starfish mm -hmm. throwing those starfish back in the ocean. You know, you can't save them all, but you can save one. It's worth Aww. it. Well, Raya, we're going to end. We have something called the Frenzy Five. And when you say, and also to your family, uh, is one thing I thought as you spoke that, because on the Frenzy's Facebook page, uh, we posted a picture several weeks ago of a woman who was a Holocaust survivor. Okay. You talk about one person making a difference. Oh. And she said, I think she turned 99 or something. And she's oh, like, okay, for my birthday, I want my entire family to uh, get together in front of um, the, the what is it, the, the praying wall uh, in Israel. Forgive me for, I'm not Jewish. The, anyway, the wailing wall? The way, maybe it's the wailing wall. And she said, I want, I want my family to be in that picture, all her descendants. Honey, they, it was this, I forgot how, a hundred something people, like all her children, oh grandchildren, great grandchildren. So it was like, and, and the, the post is, if you don't think one person can't make a difference, mm -hmm. this woman, has populated a country like she her, her, her the picture looks like a nation coming together so that. yeah so you could just be known for the, your family because i thought she wanted that picture and everybody traveled to be in that picture because obviously they don't live in the same place so she was important enough for them that she I made that it. request and they went ahead and did it so that's the legacy right there yeah exactly yeah. all right so the frenzy five array oh gosh five questions top of mind answer okay oh, Okay. It's not a test, Araya. <laughs> you made me have a pen before I started. That was a test. <laughs> I mean, the math was threw her off. The literature, <laughs> the highbrow literature threw her off. Okay, it's going to be all right. Here we go. Number okay. one, what is your cozy, happy place? The zoo. Oh, that's so cute. That's so sweet. What's your favorite framed thing in your home? So this way you can't, ha you can't start talking about that Emmy again. No, for every same thing, uh, a picture of my, me and my family. Oh, number three. What's your most memorable birthday? When I turned 50 and my family all got together and surprised me with my best friend coming up from Florida. And I got so shocked that she was there because I thought she was at the doctor's office and I fell over on a table next to me. And this couple is looking at me like, what the heck is happening here? So my feet are sticking up in the air and my best friend's there. I'm like, yay. It was the best. So cute. You're so awesome. cute. All right. Number four, what's a daily routine or ritual that you stick to? Not having one. <laughs> <laughs> that's an answer feeding my pets it has to be feeding my pets one thing i do on a regular basis <laughs> all right. i love that all right and number five of the frenzy five what fashion trend did you jump on during covid any uh, time in your life yoga pants <laughs> <laughs> yoga pants <laughs> that's uh, probably it. i probably jumped on all the trends as they go and my daughter angel is such a fashion diva it's like mom no not that trend that one's not for you <laughs> <laughs> i love it Araya, so thank, thank you for being you. on the show oh thank you ladies for all you do love you love you mm -hmm. thank you so love much you. this has been so enlightening i'm just i uh, just so in awe of your story thank oh, you for sharing it with pleasure. us you're my pleasure just live through it you guys are amazing keep up keep it up <laughs> and one, burp, burp, edit, please. Burp, 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 burp. Rewind. <laughs> Let's grab a quick question out of the You Don't Know My Life box. Feel free to steal these and use them with your tribe. You can use them at work or with your partners or friends. I think I snorted as we were coming into this. So there you go. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Here is the question. Are you ready? Ready. 
What's an unusual theme party that you threw or attended? Oh, gosh, this is so embarrassing. <laughs> ah, those are the best stories. Go ahead. A Please. long, long time ago in my 20s, I hosted a couple's Valentine's party that had naughty games and naughty prizes. <laughs> <laughs> And that's there. all I'm going to say about okay. that. Okay. Oh, I can't. We can't. We don't even get a hint. No. I mean, I know your mama. I know your mama listens to this, but I mean. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> I don't remember a ton of it. I just remember there being some sort of like truth or dare and answering a truth question about the longest big O I had ever had. And okay. I still regret to this day just blurting that out loud in front of a party. I remember there being hilarious um, gifts <laughs> given to some okay. of the couples, and it was a raucous time. Everybody had major hangovers the next day. I was going to say, I was going to say, there's a, there's some libation going on if you're, That's if you embarrassing. just. I can't believe I even said that out no, loud but, just now. No, it's not a bit. I mean, come on. It's a theme. You answer the question. I, I'll ask y'all fair more about it. Okay. okay so the theme. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. My mother listens. Yes. The theme party that, um. I hosted, which I it, it was impromptu, but in hindsight, I'm like that was that was kind of cool. It was in my twenties, early twenties, broke, um, and I knew all my friends that I worked with were broke. This is before radio. I worked at Oxford Bookstore in Atlanta, iconic bookstore at the time. If anybody's yes. in, uh, Atlantan, and it was all my Oxford Bookstore friends and. So I said that it was, well, it was my birthday. That's what it was. I was hosting my own birthday party, but I said, the only gifts you can bring are those you didn't pay for. And I said, I leave it up to you on money. And so it was, and I said, I'd rather you not steal, but I don't, you know, I, out yeah. of sight, I don't, I don't know. I don't <laughs> want to know. And so I remember getting, a, a, it, basically it was things that people had in their home that they didn't want anymore. And so I got a pink flamingo for the yard. I got uh, tarot cards. I remember that. But I got a bunch of gifts and we all laughed. And the stories, you talk about storytelling. It ended up being a storytelling party because when I would unwrap the gifts, the person who gave it to me had a great story on how they obtained that. So it wasn't like, oh, I went to the store and I bought you this or on Amazon and I got you this. It was like, oh, well, five years ago when I was all into tarot and I got this and I had this experience with, you know, and so it was really, yeah. really cool party. So I thought, you know, I'm going to have to bring that up again to where it's the, you know, it's don't, I, I want gifts that you don't pay for. And then we get to experience what the stories are around those. I may have to resurrect how that. About, how about a frenzy party? We should do a frenzy party like a that. frenzy party like that. Because, you know, pretty soon we're going to be able to gather again and be in person with people. Yes. And everybody, we can make it like a white elephant where yes. everybody has to bring a gift to the party that they didn't pay for. Right. And then we can do the white elephant trading around and get to hear the stories behind then, each one of the gifts. And the, the gift. story of where this comes from. Yes. Yes. And maybe some of the prizes from that party you talked about might show up at this. <laughs> Or no. maybe we host two parties. We could do a <laughs> Valentine's party for all women and we could make it kind of sexy. See? What do you we think? Could. Yes. Uh, there's no bad ideas, Jen Hobby. No bad <laughs> ideas. Um, all right. So Jen Hobby now, now that we've all, you know, we've uh, uh, warmed up the gears, uh, has your pep talk for the week. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So we talked a lot today about overcoming obstacles. You got to hear Aurea's amazing story. You got to hear Melissa's story and her son's beautiful analogy of overcoming the ocean because really anything is the ocean and everybody has one. So every single person has an obstacle to overcome and they're all different and yours is completely unique to you. So you have to find your unique way to keep your spirit alive through those obstacles um, and with those obstacles, because it's not like we're ever going to live a life without them. Right. Right. And so I met a woman one day named Jeannie. And Jeannie changed my life because I met her when my daughter was going through cancer. So it was, that is the toughest thing that I've ever had to overcome is to get through her cancer battle and journey. And I can't even describe to you how surreal it feels to walk into a hospital wing when just 24 hours earlier you were living a regular life and then fast forward, you're living in a hospital and you have no idea what's going on. People are telling you terms that you cannot understand. 
you're terrified for your child's life and you're just in a weird place. I was mm -hmm. just in a, it wasn't even dark yet. I got to a dark place, but it, it was just confusion almost to where my vision was blurred. Mm -hmm. That's, that's the place I was in when I got to meet Jeannie and Jeannie is another cancer mom. And her child was in the hospital battling cancer for the second or third time at the time I met her. And she had a bright personality and a smile on her face. Mm -hmm. And Jeannie and her daughter, Monica, who are just amazing, were playing Pokemon Go on the hospital floor. Okay. <laughs> they were running the around. Well. They were having so much fun catching Pikachus or Chooky Chews or whatever this they're is, called. Because it's, it's VR. So that means that they had to go down the hall and their camera would show these things in the hallway that they would have to capture on their phone. So it's, a, it's exactly. an active game. Yes. Here I am in this bizarre fog spinning place of misery trying to figure which end is up. And there's Jeannie and Monica playing games on their phone and coming to greet us to the family. And I was like, what is going on with this lady? And I got to know her and what I learned from her just by example, she never sat me down and said, knee to knee, hey, Jen, let me tell you something you need to learn. She just by example was joyful. And this is a woman who was battling cancer with her daughter for the second or third time at that point. And she welcomed us to this family of support. She was happy. And hmm. this is hard to say, but it's like, what I learned is that if their little lives were going to be short, they should be happy. They should be happy. And that's where... I'm so grateful to her for that lesson and showing me they made banners and posters and colored things and played music and they lived a happy life and mm -hmm. their ocean was cancer. Not everybody went home with their babies. Right. You know, I'm one of the lucky ones who got to take my baby home from that hospital, but I also took home lessons for a lifetime. And I am telling you, Jeannie taught me so much. And if you can take her story that she can play Pokemon jo go <laughs> and, or Pokemon, Pokemon Joe, Joe. Po Pokemon Joe be... is, is another, you know, <laughs> right. it's offshoot of that, but that, yeah, that could be the sequel. <laughs> <That's> right. <laughs> but if she can play Pokemon go through mm -hmm. cancer and she can bring joy and light and love into the midst of the toughest battle, then you too can dance in the rain. You can do it. And that's what she showed me. Yeah. No, it's, I think that's absolutely beautiful. And it's true that um, that's, we all wonder what is the meaning of life. And I think we are so, um, I think it's probably very simple. I don't think we are anywhere close to understanding it. But I think that what you just said is on the right path, where is you have to be able to face anything with a smile on your face. And, um, and that, that goes into not being the victim, right? You're not the victim. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it's not to say that you can't be sad. It's not to say that I was doing anything wrong by being in a dark place or in a fog, but it's just to remember there's still joy in the midst of the storm. There's, there's always something good going on, even when something bad's going on. I remember, um, and it's like, yes, I'm like, it's, I'm not it, about like the fake positivity thing, right? Like, that's not what I mean. I just well, it goes that... well, it goes back to the story in our own minds. Is that it? Because you have to do this. Like, you, you know, I have certainly been in a place, and Jen's been in a place, and everybody's been in a place where you just want to grab somebody by the collar and say, "Fix this." Yeah. I, I I want you to fix this. I want you to fix this for me. And again, eighty percent mental, twenty percent physical. Like I said before. The biggest struggles require wisdom it, and and sometimes they bloom into wisdom mm -hmm. like that. And again, is that the meaning of life? Like is the obstacles what whoever your source is brings into your path? They're there. They're there for a reason. And the reason is 
because what's on the other side, whether you get to bring your baby home or not, is what is the blessing. And it's hard. It's hard not to crumble, but Mm -hmm. it is um, so hard. And it's so hard in the midst of it to find the little tiny sprinkles of joy, Mm -hmm. but those little tiny sprinkles can grow. And that's what I learned from Jeannie is that I was going to do it differently. Just from the moment I saw her and how she was doing it, I was like, you know what? We do have a choice on how we're going to do it. So each day we played music and when Reese was in the hospital, she was a little baby. So we played, you know, lullabies and little kid songs. If you're happy and you know what, clap your hands and all the things that she would probably would have been doing in the mommy and me music class. And, but she was in the hospital. We did all the things. We turned the lights bright. We kept our door open as much as we could. We tried to change it from that moment forward. So I and hope talk about that. The ripple, yeah, yeah. Talk about the ripple effect from, cause Jeannie probably learned that from her daughter she said Monica's her name. Mm-hmm. So my, Mo- so just, you know, look at Monica and her life and how she rippled to her mom and then rippled to you and then rippled to Reese and the rest of your family. And then you don't know the other people on that floor that probably witnessed what you did. Yeah. And decided I'm going to do something different because just like pain is contagious, so is happiness and joy yes. and it's worth it. So I, yes. yeah, I, I want to say to the women listening, you are the emotional leader of your household. And that is through crisis or not, especially through crisis. But you are the emotional leader of your household. Everyone will follow you. A lot of times we talk about how women take a back seat to the other people in their family. We care for others. We're the caregivers, that sort of thing. But emotionally, you are the leader. Your partner will follow you. Your children will follow you. The grandparents will follow you. So in the midst of our cancer battle with Reese, Everyone was going to take their cues on how to handle it from me. Mm -hmm. If I was down in the dumps, they weren't going to be happy around me, right? Right. They, they were going to go, oh, we have to respect the mother and follow the way she is. Right. So it's a tremendous responsibility, but it's also tremendous opportunity because remember you are the emotional leader of your household. I think that's fantastic. Fantastic advice. And I ask you to please subscribe to the Frenzy Podcast because these are the conversations we have. Um, We'd love for you to leave a review. Let us know how this affects you. You know, the one thing that Jen and I, since we're used to being on the radio and getting callers, uh, here we can't get callers. So that's why we We need to hear from you. (laughs) Exactly. So that's why we ask you to leave a review because that's the only way we we hear from you. Uh, You can also (laughs) sign up for our weekly email. We are going to send the episode right into your email box, uh, your inbox. So if you're somebody that, yeah, I don't want to mess with all that, we'll send it to you. We promise not to bug the crap out of you. Uh, <laughs> sending that each week. Uh, sign up at thefrenzy.com. Also, YouTube, uh, look us up, The Frenzy. Uh, and you can always email us, Melissa at thefrenzy.com and Jen at thefrenzy.com, because we would love to hear from you and your stories as well. And is there a friend of yours who would enjoy this episode? Definitely please share this with her. And if you like this show, please share about it on your social media. You can tag us so we can see it and then we can share it as well. Thanks to listeners who have subscribed to our email list at thefrenzy.com. Three new names, Carrie Jacobs. Thank you, love. Deanna Anderson. Thank you. And Christy Olds. Thank you very much. Soundtrack produced by Tammy Hurt for Placement Music, written and recorded by Placement Music creative team member Mark Daniels. The Frenzy's graphic design is by Helen Vickers and web design by Caden Jacobs. These are real stories by real women. And now it's time to go share yours with the world. Thank you all so much for the gift of your time. We know there are a lot of demands on it. And the fact that we are in your ears and you're hanging out with us really means the world to us. We appreciate you. All right. So until next week, trust your gut. Share your story. Stop, stop lying, lying about, about your, your age. age. All right. We'll see you we next week. Okay? <laughs> I don't know, but we'll, we'll try again next week. Try again. <laughs>